And Sato's Place is brought to you by... We've got one of Nashville's finest, a brand new ITL, another giveaway. Happy holidays. Let's roll it, Will. Pensado's place. Uh, we're going to have a great, great show today. Got a good buddy of mine on from Nashville. How you doing, Mr. Trawick? I'm good, man. How about you? Oh, man, I'm doing great. Yeah. I mean, just... Uh, um, just really excited about today. Living the dream. I'm always excited. <laughs> Absolutely. We got a, a really great guest. You yeah. had a really good week? I did. I did. Really um, busy. Yeah, I worked with uh, Rachel and the Kings. They won a contest with Don Was, oh, work, cool. working with them. That was a lot of fun. Cool, 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 cool. Why don't we get our uh, homework and stuff out of the way? Let's we, do it. Let's get to our, to our talent. You know, we're coming live from Studio B at the Art Institute of Los Angeles, of California, Los Angeles. It's always a great place to see our crew. Yeah, um, we got the best crew. So, folks, as usual, you know where to get us in terms of our homework, Facebook, Twitter, and our YouTube channel, pensadosplace.tv, or forward slash YouTube. Mm -hmm. you definitely get there. Um, Want to say hello to our friends, as usual, Vintage King. Yay! Yeah, we Vintage love Vintage King. King. Say hello to all those guys. Um, some good stuff coming from Vintage King soon. It's called Vintage King LA. Oh, and we're going to actually go down there and do some cool opening stuff. Um, you're going to get a lot of in-depth gear demos coming and stuff from there. The word on the street is that place is incredible. Uh, absolutely. Um, also, Don't want to give it away yet. But. Okay. All right. And we'll do it. We, our, our scout has gone down there, Mr. Will. Are my tones mellifluous today with this new mic? They are very mellifluous. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Are they dulcet? Um, let's stick with mellifluous for now. I practiced that for an hour. I missed it. Uh, also, our good buddies, Avid, which we obviously we love our Avid guys. They're doing a cool thing. Um, Avid and Guitar Center are partnering to offer free Pro Tools classes. So they're going to be on July 7th and July 14th. Those are both Saturdays. Uh, every Guitar Center will have it. Um, make sure you go do that. So it, where you can find out the information is guitar.com forward slash recording hyphen made hyphen easy. Let's do that again. Guitarcenter.com forward slash recording hyphen made hyphen easy. So that's a cool thing from our friends at Abbott who, who we also love. Um, and that beautiful piece of machinery you're holding there. Man, this is... Uh this is uh, one of the new Telefunken M80 microphones. Um, basically, the, I love this microphone because there's, there's, there's so many uses for it. It's a dynamic microphone. You can use it on drums, guitars. It, it handles a lot of uh, sound pressure level, and it just sounds good, as you can tell. <laughs> right. And you can get one of those. So the way you get that and enter is um, go to pensadosplace.tv forward slash Telefunken. When in doubt, pensadosplace dot tv forward slash telefunken it's the m80 it's july 4th and look at this cool box like an m80 <laughs> fireworks i can't win the microphone can i win the box yeah we'll give you the box so you no know, because i work in the box absolutely of course you work in the box so make sure you enter and get into that contest and so on and so forth now that we got all that good stuff out of the way why don't we have you dave introduce the new itl guys um I, I, I started trying to come up with some different funny names, but I couldn't think of that quickly enough. But basically what I'm trying to show you this, this week is some unique uses of, of drum trigger plugins other than just a trigger drum. So I think you'll, I think you'll find it pretty cool. Hey, everybody. Um, we've been doing a little bit of a philosophical group of ITL, so today I thought we'd uh, get back to what we do best, drums. Um, sometimes when you are working with a, a drum, you think that that particular drum is what has to generate your reverbs, your um, delays, the, the, the sound. That's not true. I'm gonna show you a couple little, little things. I made a copy of the original snare, which is here. I don't know if you can see my thing. Um, and, and then uh, this track here is a copy. So what I've done on this copy is I've placed 
my favorite trigger, call trigger. I'm gonna let the sample that I generate with, with trigger, I'm gonna let that control my reverb. So um, let's do this. Here's, here's the original snare. Now if we put a reverb on that, Not bad. Now let's do this. This, on our copy right below that, let's put trigger on there and let's put a kick drum. Um, so I've just got a basic kick drum. Okay, this is what the, this is what the kick drum sample sounds like. Okay, so that's our kick drum sample. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna send the kick drum sample to a reverb, not the snare itself. So the kick is triggering the reverb. And of course I've taken the kick out of the stereo bus. So all we're hearing is the return from the reverb generated by this second track here. Now let's add that to our original snare. Take it off. Good. On. Okay, so what what that's one example of of, of, of what we can do. Now, let's say I had a a a, a program snare but I wanted to give it a little bit of a vibe I could trigger the the reverb for that snare from a live snare gosh I mean the sky's the limit with this technique now now let's see what happens if we if we put a little reverb on a little EQ on it before we send it to the reverb So you see, kind of the, the, the possibilities are, are, are limitless. Now let's try something else. Let's say you've got a sample and you like the decay of the sample, you like the ambience on the sample. Well, what you can do is you can, you can take the sample, like here's the sample. Well, what I did was I took just this part of the sample And I say I save that. Now watch what happens. I saved it as ITL7. So now when we trigger our sounds. Okay, so you see now I brought that just that little tail of the sample. That's being triggered. Now let's add that to our snare. Okay, so this is what we got with it in the track. I'm gonna mute it. With it. Let's crank it up, let's crank it up. There you go. So you can take pieces of samples. You can take words. Every time, every time the snare hits, you can have a word go off. You can do whatever you want to do. You can do it with kick drums. You can do it with all kinds of things. 
Let me show you a couple more little, little examples. I've got a clap sound that I, I like. This sample is kind of clappy. And let's, let's add that into our live snare and see what happens. Without it. We're not trying to make it sound R and B, we're just trying to add a little bit of, a little bit of aggressiveness to the snare sound that, that 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 sometimes it's hard to get. But I think that's a that kind of gives you an idea of of another way to to accomplish some of this stuff. Another thing we can do, I had a snare, a real snare sample. I wanted to show you. Now what we can do with this is let's take it out of the stereo bus and let's put a little EQ on it. Add it to our reverb. Take our send to the reverb from this the, the snare and just add a little bit of mid-range and gives it a little bit of an aggressive thing. Let me take it out. Let me solo, solo, solo what I'm doing for you. I wish there was a quick way to do this. Probably is. You guys will let me know. I know. So that's what I'm sending to the reverb. Like, like I always tell you guys, don't, don't just look at what I'm showing you as the end result. What I always tell you and what I'm going to always tell you is, let this be an example of how there are no limits, there are no rules. You can do anything your mind can think of, you can find a use for it. Um, and then in, in, in an upcoming ITL, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you how to do some similar things with vocals. So stay tuned for that. Thanks. Hey everybody, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, I, uh, uh, as always, you know, send me your ideas. I'd like to learn some of your stuff. Man, today we've got Justin Kneebank, probably one of the busiest guys in the world of audio, and uh, a friend of mine, someone whose work I've admired for a long, long time, and uh, I can't wait to introduce him to you guys, those of you that don't already know about him. Uh, he's won three Grammys. He's, he's done Taylor Swift, uh, Keith Urban, Vince Gill, um, Rascal Flatts, Eric Clapton. Who am I leaving out? We're leaving out somebody. We'll talk about it as we go along. Justin, welcome, my friend. Thank you so much. Good to see you, Dave. Justin. Uh, how's, uh, how's the weather in Nashville? We wish we were in Santa Monica today. It's probably going to be 96 today. Yeah, right. we're, uh, we're experiencing a lot of 10K, a lot of 15K, <laughs> moderate 2K, and we don't have any low frequencies out here. It's all working good, man. Well, the records are so thin from California. Hey, hey, oh, I resemble that remark. Uh, I'll put my low end up against anything out of Nashville. <laughs> and records, too. <laughs> I was about to say, either. <laughs> you know what? Uh, all kidding aside, um, I, I, I still maintain that the best sounding records in the world and the best players in the world, the best songwriters in the world are in Nashville. But let's go to Chicago, your hometown. You you uh, you had one of the coolest starts of any guest we've had on. Uh, you started with Alligator Records after you uh, completed your, uh, your 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 education. Alligator Records, for those of you, most of you don't know, but probably the hippest, coolest blues label 
ever, and they're still going. They, I mean, they have all the blues greats, and they've had all the blues greats. They, they support the blues. They've got a blues magazine. But anyway, man, explain to me some of those experiences you had. Uh, describe some of them with Alligator when you first started out. Well, I was, I was working in a studio in Chicago called Streeterville, and it was my day gig. I was a musician and playing in a band, and it was a great day gig to work at a studio, and I was doing jingles all day. And uh, I got a call one day about this label, Alligator, which I knew a little bit about. They had done Hum Dog Taylor, and I loved that record. Yeah. And uh, they called, and they said they got this guy, Johnny Winter, and, he's, and they're having problems at the studio. They had, can they come by? And, and someone recommended me, and I did a Johnny Winter record. And uh, I was just like this completely, you know, unequipped to be able to handle it. Kid from the suburbs, I didn't know anything. And uh, it started a relationship. I did close to 30 records with Alligator. Wow. And uh, and from Johnny Winter to Lonnie Mack to Coco Taylor, Lonnie Brooks, my favorite. Um, it's just, it's incredible. How did you get from, uh, well, just a little aside, uh, uh, people that haven't played on jingle sessions don't understand the speed and pace with which those things move at. That, that must have been good training for... Uh, for, for learning how to work under pressure, because those, those jingle sessions fly. Well, it was, you know, it's, it's kind of too bad that a lot of young folks can't work on jingles, because for me, I thought it was a killer experience. And in fact, it, it ultimately kind of changed my career, because I wanted to be a musician and be in a band and be an artist. But when I worked on jingles, you know, I would work on three different types of music every day. And it kind of made me go, God, man, I, I, I love music so much, and I love being in the studio and don't like being on the road. You know, this is a, this is it opened my eyes. But the thing that was the coolest was that on a jingle session back then, you get in there at eight o'clock in the morning. At nine o'clock, you have a full rhythm section, yeah. strings, yeah. horns, singers, and you got to get your sounds in one pass and be recording on the second and and have it mixed by noon. And you run down the hallway the moment it's mixed and start another one. Yeah. And I would do that day in and day out. And it's you know I kind of miss it. I mean, I did a, a Christmas record recently where I where I was able to do strings and horns all together again. I thought, God, man, I miss this so much. You know, I love, I love the pressure. So many records now because nobody, everyone puts their decisions off till later. There's no pressure. And I think we all work better when we're under pressure. I, th I, think, I, think, I think you hit a nail on the head. I think pressure and deadlines can be healthy things for us. There's some people that don't work good under pressure, but uh, I, I'm like you. I kind of like the pressure. I like good pressure. I don't like that crappy pressure, though. No, I mean, like I say, it, it's good pressure. I mean. The cool thing about nowadays is you can work. I, I, I prefer to call it momentum. You know? <laughs> just keep it, keep, keep it going. I just, you know, to me, the one thing I like about jingles is you get there in the morning and you crank all day. You know, you just go for it. And I, I would imagine there's no better boot camp to be yeah. able to, to, to do that under pressure, deal with the whole process, know that you've got more stuff facing you and have to perform. Yeah? And, and, and here's the cool thing is it was also like tons of different kinds of music. Like I say, in the morning, it'd be an orchestral date, it'd be a rock and roll date at noon, and then maybe a barbershop quartet at 4 o'clock. Wow. I mean, it was wow. like that. It was, and so you learned all about different types of music and, and interacting with musicians, because ultimately that's what it's about. I mean, getting great sounds is obviously a big thing, but being able to interact with musicians and make them play well um, and get, get a good headphone mix, that's the other thing. Hmm. Justin, would it, would it be a fair sentence to say that, um, that when you worked on Mine uh, by Taylor Swift, big, big record, that you did that all in the box? I did. So it was all in the box, right? I did her last record all in the box. No mm. joke. Mm. I did split it out, though, in a dangerous audio split-out box. Cha-ching. <laughs> <laughs> take me through, uh, like, take, take my audience. Um, can I ask you some specific questions about the process? Um, for example, a lot of times you like to, I, I, I think I hear that you like to, to bring your vocals up on maybe two or three channels and then have different frequencies, different compressions on each one, and then you kind of combine those, and then as the mix goes along, you kind of use different combinations of those three. Is that, ac is that true? Yeah, absolutely. That, when I discovered that about 10 years ago, that was kind of the thing that helped kind of kick me up a little bit. It, was, it just inspired me so much to be able to, be able to change that. And I do the same thing in the box. Did you discover that through my EQ magazine article where I described the same exact process for Christina? In fact, I keep that article right here. <laughs> <laughs> so, so let's start by saying 
Were you happy with the process? Did you feel it could have been better had you gone a traditional analog route? As far as mixing in the box? Sonically, and, as far as sonically. For me, it's all kind of the same. If it's a, I, I don't, it, it, without getting long-winded about it, it kind of takes me back to the days like when I remember I first started working on an SSL and I would work with people and they'd say, man, I'll never work on an SSL, I'll only work on Neve, or I won't never work on a Neve, or I'll only work on SSL, or I'll never do digital, I'll only do analog. It was like, Man, oh man, quit making rules, man. It's the song. Follow the song and whatever works, you know. If it's yeah. a great song and a compelling performance, then get the gig done, man. It's like, it's yeah. not that hard. I think great engineers like yourself that work on feel and emotion and taste, I think, I think great engineers mix to what they're hearing. The process isn't as important as the music. I think, uh, in fact, I think you said one time, don't make the recording process more important than the music, so. Yeah, it's a big deal. I mean. I, that's why I became an engineer the first time is because, you know, engineers, I, I engineers troubled me because they were more interested in the mic cables and the mics. And I was more interested in hitting the red button and let's get, let's make some music. I, I, I got to admit that, that for times in my career, I've been that guy that I kind of worshiped gear. And then the, the, the deal breaker for me was like a $400 power cable that was some kind somehow just plugging a, changing the cord you used to plug your gear in the wall with and, Buying one for two or three hundred bucks would make your stuff sound better. That's when they lost me. I, I bought a silver wire mic cable and I hang it in a place of prominence in my <laughs> just to remind myself of what not to do. Not that it's not great, I'm sure it sounds wonderful, but that's to me, it's like, get me a cable, get me a mic, hit record. Uh, in Batter's Box, we're going to go over some of this stuff, but. Um, what was what 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 compressor did you use in the box on on uh, Taylor's vocals on that record? Well, David, like a lot of stuff, and maybe it's just because I'm just a, I'm a dumbass, but I don't have like a template that I ever do. I try to make every artist. I try to come up with a a program for them with EQs and mm -hmm. compression and reverbs and delays that's mm -hmm. unique to that. I mean, obviously, I can't make everything completely unique, but I at least make the attempt. Right. So every song is slightly different. I mean, I would say that if I defaulted, I had probably I had three vocal channels. One probably had a Renaissance box on it because I think that's a great, just sort of nice leveler. It, whatever they're doing, it waves with that sounds really good to me. It's just a simple, subtle compression. And then I'll maybe run it through a fat cell with all the buttons in and crush it. And then maybe through an 1176 plug in. And depending on the song and the tempo, I'll use either like the silver face emulation or a black face emulation. And then, you know, where I throw the EQ and the de is all dependent on the song and all that. But you, that's okay, like all those together, and then I still send it through a submix. And maybe I'll even again put it, you know, maybe I'll put like the, the Crane song Phoenix on it sometimes just to oh, wow. a little warmth. Do, 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 on the on the on the fat so do you use the UAD one which is excellent or the uh, the Kush audio one which is excellent? I use the UAD one although I do ha I'm a I'd like to meet that Kush audio guy. He's cool. I'll hook it up. That, that's very um, he, that's he, a, his plug that new plug in is it's it's a little too smart for me right now because it takes me sometimes to learn stuff. Yeah, I talked to him about it. He he made some presets because to me that's the best way to learn a plug in is just flip through the okay. presets. Everybody in your audience should check that out because that's really cool. Oh, and, I'm glad you said that because he's a great, great guy, Greg. And I have his EQ, his outboard EQ, and his Fatso. The and Clarifonic? I use those all the time. The Clarifonic? Yeah, the Clarifonic EQ is cool. And his version of the Fatso, I use tracking all the time on the Super Crush mode because it does a certain thing that I can't get with any other compression. I, I, I know him. I'll introduce you to him. Um, in terms of some of the effects that you used on that record, I, I hear some of your reverbs, and they're not, they're not wide, they're mono. Are you, are you actually taking your reverbs and making them mono? Uh, it's always a combination. Um, I've always been a mono reverb freak, like spring reverbs and stuff. Uh -huh. and maybe it's just because my favorite records are like old 50s records and 60s records, and I love the way that I would hear mono reverbs. It felt like you were looking through a keyhole into another world and I just always was like so engaging to me and it and and then I started messing around with it several years ago because I would always use like, like I love the 480 and I love the Procasti and uh -huh. the 250 but when I started putting mono reverbs down the middle it just it just made it sound like I don't know in another place or it just made it, it took the emotion to another level 
So I'll use spring reverbs. I use the uh, the space echo, the UAD space echo, a lot, and I use the reverb in that. And I think on Taylor's record, I used a lot of the space echo. They have one where it's a combination of reverb and a little delay, and I'll just tuck it in there until I find the moment where it just emotionally gets me. And and, and the thing I like about it, just that sound when I hear it on, on laptop speakers or in the car or on a walking down the aisle at the grocery at the grocery store, I still hear that sound, which is cool. The the the. Uh the delay were you using like a slap or like a a, a quarter eighth? Well, I, I I'm pretty boring, Dave. I, I I use like a I use a short one just to give it a little bit of life, you know. Anywhere oh, okay. depends once again on the song and the singer, right. but ninety milliseconds and one hundred and twenty, and just yeah. and find that little magic spot where it just opens it up, and then sometimes I'll put a widener on that. Um, and then, you know, I'll drop longer choruses, longer delays in on the choruses, or a different delay yeah. in on the second verse, yeah. and a different delay on the bridge. The reason, I, the reason I'm asking you about this stuff is because I just love your vocals. Your vocals just are the star of the show, and, and, and of course, that's, that's something that you're rewarded for greatly in Nashville because they, they put such importance on the lyrics and the vocals. But of, of, of all the great engineers in Nashville, I think you're at the top of the heap in terms of the way you set your vocals and just... It's like it's like the brightest spotlight ever on the vocal, but you said something that, that just is, is, it, it, this fascinates me. And I, I, I want I want to get to the bottom of this. Two things: one is is the mono. What what are you hearing? I know what you're feeling, but when when you hear it in mono, what should I be listening for to 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 to, to start getting good at that technique? Well, I just, just I mean to me it's just first off it. It's like any uh, any reverb. I don't. If all the reverbs sound like perfect high fidelity reverbs, it's uh -huh. boring to me. I love using one or two high fidelity, but then I like using narrowing the bandwidth down a lot of them. So it it sits in a different place in the mix, whether it be in guitar or vocal. And like that's why I love emulations or real spring reverbs because they're just not high fi sounding, and it adds oh. a color to the vocal that somehow makes it just sound warmer and more important and more soulful to me and maybe because i'm just an old dude and it's like when i hear motown records or memphis records they're always those mono reverbs and yeah, it's just, a, it just it sounds like soul music to me emt 140 plate yeah the um the spring reverb thing i i, I of course I, whenever i think of spring reverb i think of guitars but what what, is, what you like about it on a vocal is the fact that it doesn't have a lot of high end on it. Like it, it takes it just, a nose dive at three four k. Yeah, it reacts to vocals differently. You know, a, a digital reverb or a plate will will react to transients different than a spring reverb will. And I like what it does. You know, it just oh, I get it. Okay, I see what you're saying. Words and, and and places in the vocal that you wouldn't expect. So, one of the things that I like to do is use the. Uh, the Eventide 2016 and roll the top end off like at 4K, something like that. I, I stole that from Mick Gazowski's uh, records on Mariah Carey. That sound of that reverb just, I, I don't know, it just captured me. And, and so I understand what you're saying about sometimes the need to take some of the top end off a of reverb. It just, it just helps it amplify the expressiveness of the vocal. I agree. It's, it, 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 and it also maybe keeps a little bit clearer around the top end you know, in that spot on a vocal where all the, the emotion and, and stuff that communicates to people when they're when they're growling or they're breathing or they're coming off of a word and, and, and the tone is going away and the breath is coming out, if you leave room for that to happen, I think it communicates better. And if the reverbs are covering that up, it's not great. Another thing that I like about your records is sometimes I have this inexplainable, unexplainable need to be wide with my mixes. And sometimes you unabashedly accomplish more than I do by just making them less than wide. Is that an intentional thing? It's partially. I mean, I, I'm i one of those people, I wish I, I have a bunch of like things, tricks that I used to try to do to make the mixes wider and wider. And then I would do it and then I would, maybe it's just going back to my jingle days or radio days, I don't know, but it's like, if. A person decides they like a song, and it, here's what, I'm sorry, let me start over. I remember decide, when I was trying to learn how to mix, I would go over to all my friends' houses and see how they had their speakers set up at their houses. Mm -hmm. And 99 out of 100 had one speaker in one room and one other speaker in another room, and one was pointing up the ceiling, and one was pointing at the coffee <laughs> table, 
And it was like, you didn't hear anything that resembled what people were doing in the studios. And I thought, I thought to myself, okay, if I mix just for engineers, I'm never going to have a career. I mean, if, I, if just people who are sit in front of speakers all day long like this, uh -huh. and, and that's all they care about, if I mix for them, it's over. So, and the lesson I learned is that mono compatibility, if everything is like panned all the way out, you run into trouble with that. And so it's, but to me, I mean, I'll always have some stuff out there, but I like, I'll crack stuff in just a little bit, and then I'll work the middle a little bit more, and then I obsess about when things offset each other. So it, hopefully it sounds wide, but it's maybe not all the way out. But it, it, mm -hmm. when I like it, once again, it's my hearing it in the grocery store aisle. I want to hear everything, no matter where it is. I, I think I'm gonna try some of that, just because uh, just because I love your records. Because um, I've kind of started disregarding mono lately. Kind of, I, I kind of look at mono as kind of like black and white TV. I'm not sure I need to even pay attention to it anymore. But I, I like the sound of your records, and I think it's I think it's because you have such a clue clearly defined middle. Another thing I like about your records, Justin, is um, you don't seem to be enchanted and, and um, ruled by the, the over-compressed loudness thing. Your records are loud, but, but there's room for things to expand and hit the ceiling and, and just... Uh, how, how do you get your records loud without fighting that war the wrong way? Well, that's a... Well, is that about a 20-day discussion? I mean... Mm -hmm. I'm going to go out on a limb here. Well, let me rephrase the question. Uh, you're not interested in fighting that battle, right? Well, I mean, we're all interested. We fight it every day. Anyone who does makes records, or anyone who masters records, is fighting the level thing, and it drives me completely crazy because it's just we're making the majority of the records that are out there sound horrible to me because there's no dynamics. And the irony is, is that dynamic records sound better on the radio. They sound better on television. They sound mm. better in all coming off of laptop speakers. But you, it's hard to tell a young band who wants their record to be louder than everybody else, or an artist, or an A and R person. You know, I'm, I kind of get away with it in Nashville because I've been doing. I've been here long enough that I, could, if an A and R person kind of gives me that look of like, is this loud enough? And I'm like, trust me. <laughs> you know, but you know, I can't do that with most A and R people outside of this town. I'm, it's and I know. What, and I know that everybody who does what we do, Dave, goes through this. Oh, yeah. yeah. Crazy. Yeah. Dynamics ultimately communicate music better. There's just no way around it. And, and it gives the mastering guy something to do, man. I mean, those guys are great. You know, give, give them do their job. Yeah, I, I agree. Well, maybe, maybe we can kind of champion that. I, I, I've kind of been going in the wrong direction for a while. I've got, I've got my mixes so damn loud, I'm not happy with them anymore. I'm going to go the other way. Um, was it you that said, Justin, that that loud compressed mixes will make you like it a lot the first time, but n not the second, third, and fourth? That, that that doesn't it doesn't stimulate people wanting to purchase and listen to something over long periods of time, but it'll get it for you once. I'm not sure I'm the only person who said that, but I, I feel like that's a big problem, and I, I feel like engineers are contributing to the record sales being down because people don't engage records anymore. It doesn't mean anything to them. They'll hear it on the radio and they'll kind of get off on it, but. If you're listening to a record that's clawing your ears out, you stop listening to it, yeah. and that's what these records, thats what most records sound like to me. Yeah, so it's not that—that's not a function so much of the the volume as the as the lack of dynamics. And by dynamics, I mean what you feel when you go see a live concert. Exactly. <laughs> you, you, know. you know, the thing, the thing you, you, I'm glad you pointed out the, the vocal thing for me, and, and you know, obviously, I came up you know, in the late 80s and the 90s, and I was trying to compete with all the great mixers of the world, yourself included, and, but all the guys who, who template stuff and make, and, and I couldn't beat their mixes for what they're doing, so I had to come up with the thing that would work for me that I felt like it would compete, in, in a, not, not as a competition, but it would sit up and mean something. It would, the, whatever the artist is trying to get across, it would happen, and the only way that I could figure that out was to get a killer vocal sound that when the artist walked in the room, they, they would tear up because they'd never heard their <laughs> vocal sound that way. And the, less, the thing that shocked me was the moment I kind of figured a few things out to get it there, all of a sudden getting drum sounds, all that stuff was so much easier because you had the beacon in your mix to be able to decide where everything sat. And also what went with that was now all of a sudden dynamics came over into play. It wasn't just about like, I'm going to get the most world's greatest drum sound and it's just a flat line 
drum sound that maybe sounds great on its own, but you try to put things around it, it gets boring after multiple listenings. I feel like records that where it, the, the focal, the, the communication of the singer, you know, just broad, just broadcast to people emotionally better. I agree. In, in, uh, in, in, uh, in a lot of my world, I'm dealing with program drums and program instruments that don't change volumes a lot. And the only dynamics I have is the vocal. So I have to kind of not exaggerate those dynamics, but I have to certainly spotlight them or things don't change for four minutes. I, w I, want, you to, I want you to amplify something. Um, I'm fascinated by your vocals, and, I'm, and you said something that, that, that sparked my interest. A lot of the great engineers I've had on the show talk about starting with the vocal and, and always leaving the vocal in the process so they can wrap things around it, as opposed to adding the vocal later and hoping it just fits somehow. Is that what you do? Not, not the adding it later and have it fit, but... I, I think that uh, I kind of do it both ways. I mean, I'll always check it against the vocal. But yeah, but that's another great lesson. How many times when you're a young engineer, you go, God, I had the track sounding so good when I put the vocal in, everything sounded terrible. Yeah. It's like, oh, you start the other way. It's a two-pronged thing for me. It's, it's always having the vocal in mind. And then also for me, just because I'm a musician, I try to learn every part that's on the record. And so if somebody said, ah, man, I don't like the direction, I can just pull all the faders down and start over and have another mix in five minutes. But the idea is... I, you know, once I sort of place, get the vocal sound happening, it, it's it, I build everything around it. I got man, you, you're the first person I've ever heard say you have to learn every part before you can mix. I, I, I'm that way, and and I thought I was alone, but man, now I know why I like your stuff. <laughs> right that's, back at you. That's that's here. a sad thing that we have to do that. It, 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 it takes so long, but I don't know how else to do it. I'm glad you said that. Can you repeat that once for Herb so he'll know why it takes so long sometimes? Yeah, please. <laughs> please, please, don't, do that. please don't rush his mixes. Please don't. So, uh, why don't we? Uh, how's your arm? Is your arm loose? Oh yeah, I'm ready. We, we want to put Justin in the batter's box. I think so. I actually, we we actually don't need to throw any balls. He's so good. We will just listen to whatever he says. Okay. So let's uh, I, let's let's put you in the batter's box and toss some stuff up. Okay, Justin. Uh, plug in or analog? I'd prefer plug in, but I'll take whatever you want to give me. First thing that comes to mind when you. Uh, Look Pull up a rhythm guitar. 1176. Nice. Cool. This is going to be good, Herb. Yeah, absolutely. I think I'm in trouble. <laughs> Lead guitar. I got him, Herb. I got him. He's thinking. <laughs> Delays, man. Okay. Cool. Uh, vocals. Lead vocals. I've already told you about that. There's too many things. Okay. Love I'll accept traps. that. Excellent answer. Uh, cymbals. Close mic cymbals. Ooh, fast attack. Okay. Oh, that's good to know. Uh, snare drums. Uh, decapitator. Ooh, I want to talk to him about that. Kick drums. SSL. Mm -hmm. Bass, live bass. 1176. Uh, that's fatso. Sorry. Yeah, gotcha. Uh, overhead mics. Yeah, with a tranny on. Oh, okay. Overhead mics. You did that. Oh, cymbals. That was cymbals. I'm, you don't close mic your, you don't, okay. We'll skip that. How about room mics? Uh, EMI, 1176, Fatso. Well, the best room mics I ever get are from Nashville. Holy cow, what those guys do. Okay, this is a tricky one. Oh, Record boy. company politics. <laughs> I don't answer my phone. <laughs> <laughs> Cold run. Out of the park. <laughs> uh, mix bus, two bus, stereo bus. Uh, SSL. Can I? I saw something on your thing the other day. Those Magi cues. Is that, am I pronouncing that right? Yeah. They're an emulation of my two mix EQ, the EQ 3D by Night Pro. Remember that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I use them every day. Every day. I'll introduce you to Cliff, too. He'd love you. Uh, how do you deal with less than stellar playing ability? Mm. It doesn't happen where I come from. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious, man. I'll, I'll, yeah, send you, I'll, I'll send you some tracks. And by the way, that could be the highest score ever in Batter's Box, uh, Herb. Man, it is. It's the, certainly the, top two. The record company Politics, that was, that was a home run. Yeah. I, that was a... Grand Slam. Yeah, the, the trophy's on the way to Nashville now. Yeah. Being, we're overnighting it. Um, he, did, he did stumble on the bass. He forgot about 
yeah. something he but said that, earlier. But that's designed but, to just show humanity. We'll give him a walk for that That's one. designed to show <laughs> humanity. <laughs> he's not an android. He was, he was trying to be humble. Uh, yeah, absolutely. That's well, what that's you good. do. I mean, just, he, that's at, graciousness. At his skill level, a little humility's in order. Incredible. Incredible. Why don't, we, um, why don't we talk to our man? We have a new guy in our corner office who's got some questions for us. Well, he's not a new guy. Well, he's new to our audience, so it's going to be nice for him to meet him. So everybody, meet our producer in the corner office, Mr. Will Thompson. Will! Hello. Hello. Will. I'm here. Yeah. I replaced Drew today. Absolutely. <laughs> What's going to be your gimmick? Drew's I don't have a point. gimmick yet. I'm... Is this on? Is this on? <laughs> so I'm just going to go right to it. Sure. Okay. Um, first one here is uh, from Brett Donaldson. Hi, Justin. Can you offer any advice on EQing and panning acoustic guitars when it's only voice and guitar in the track? Well, it depends how many mics there are. I mean, I work a lot with multiple mics on the acoustic, so I'll spread it out. There's one. Once again, it comes back to that mono thing, you know? There's nothing wrong with having everything go right down the middle and putting the space around it and creating a great space that, that's wide. Um, hmm. The one thing about live acoustic and vocal, that's a really great trick to be able to make it sound where there's no phase issues. So that's, Pro Tools has been great with that to be able to check the phase so it has a nice full sound. Have you played with that new Waves phase plug-in? I, I tried it. It's, it's above my learning curve, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> I'll send it. I'll have them send somebody over to do they have a representative that can show me how to use that well, thing? Yeah, uh, Scott Peterson is near you. You got to know Scott. God, Liam, I'm going to introduce him to everybody. Will, let's tip another one. Uh, kind of staying in the same vein with guitars. This one's from Will Young. What is your go-to signal chain for the, that twangy guitar country rock sound? Your choice of guitar, strings, EQ, compression, etc. I don't know if I can answer about strings, but obviously a Telecaster through a Blackface Deluxe 66 script. That's the ultimate ch signal chain. And then good old SM57, a Royer. My other favorite mic on electric guitars, to give it something that sounds a little more vintage, is a great 67. I'm back freaking out over those these days. Neves, 1176s. <laughs> and then maybe a little 2BQ in the mix. And, it's, and a little, you know, slap. And not too much, but a lot of the really, really great acoustic um, electric players in country, not that I work with a lot of the real chicken picking guys, but they use Dynacomps, which is the MXR compressor. But you got to be careful not to do, overdo it. Yeah. This one's from um, American Contagion Recordings. Uh, what do you think is the future of the professional mixing engineer? Budgets are getting smaller and smaller. Young artists do more and more of their own recording and mixing. Uh, landscaping work. <laughs> Comparable skills. Can, can, I, can I take a crack at that one? Please. Uh, uh, about 10 years ago, Chris Lord Algae told me, Dave, when things get tight, the whole industry goes for quality. And I thought that was a, a, a brilliant response to, to the fact that things are getting smaller. So if you want to keep working and work forever, make sure you're known for quality, make sure you deliver quality, make sure you deliver like, like Herb always says, under promise, over deliver. Um, yeah, more than they ask for. Yeah, and, and, and our guest today, Justin, certainly exemplifies oh, that. Well, I mean, he's yeah. a producer, a musician, engineer, so when you hire him, you get your money's in worth. Every, in every way possible, yeah. absolutely. Uh, have I got time for one little quick question? We have Herb? time for one more question from Will and one more question from I, you. I want to reserve a question for him. Like, like I have go ahead, ask, ask yours, you. Dave, and we'll go back. Okay. Uh, Justin, when you answered, uh, I, I can't remember if it was Brett's or Will's question, um, you, you talked about putting the, um, you talked about putting the, the guitar and the vocal in the middle and then s s adding space around it. What does that adding space around it sentence mean? You lost me there. Uh, is, that, is that where you put effects or other, other yeah, instruments? Effects, yeah. I mean, you know something that's really cool that I, I, that I wish people did more when I mixed is if they got an acoustic, go ahead and, up and put up a room mic for an acoustic guitar, man. It's, it's great, and that's a great thing to be able to pan off. And then basically, once I heard that sound of having a room mic on the acoustic, I'm just trying to emulate that with reverbs like the Bercasti. Oh, Cha-ching, cool. hopefully they'll send me one. <laughs> I love oh. Bercasti. Do you ever, do you ever take, take that guitar signal and and run it back out to the studio with a speaker and then mic that speaker and mic the room and then add that back in as a simulation for the room? 
I wish I could do that more. I just don't, I don't have a mixed room where I can, I don't have a room. My mixed room is just is separate. So I, I've, I've gotten used to kind of emulating it with reverbs. I've spent so much time fiddling at home in my PJs at three in the morning trying to come up with accurate sounding room sounds. Well, that's an image I didn't need, but go ahead. They're bunny, man. They got bunny feet. <laughs> well, <there you go. laughs> Will, you, let's get one more in from the corner office. Okay, uh, last one is from Kurt Gibbs, and it's for Justin. When mixing a live drum kit, how often are drum samples used to supplement sounds in country music? Holy cow, that's the best corner office we've ever had. That is good. Uh, it depends on who's mixing it. Um, that's a big bone of contention for me with a lot of mixes that I hear. The thought of just without even listening to the track, replacing the drums is horrible to me. To me, if a high-quality engineer has spent time getting a drum sound, you should be respectful of that and try to figure out where they were that day on the tracking and try to emulate that or at least you know, use it as a starting spot. Mm -hmm. That said, I mean, I feel like you're failing if you use samples in, in, in trying to get something live to start off. Now, that doesn't mean that everything doesn't work. I mean, sometimes nowadays when people overdub on stuff, the sound of the drums doesn't match anymore where the, the overdubbed instruments go, and you have to kind of follow that or you didn't get enough bottom snare, or the kick drum just was, wasn't tuned right. And so I'll use them to supplement tones, but by and large, I don't just default to it. And there are a lot of folks who do, and, and it, I, don't, I'm, I don't dig that. Can I, can I toss two, two cents? Yeah. Um, I agree 100%. In the, in the early 90s, I used to replace a lot of stuff because my sounds were better. Now people have access to better engineering, better sounds, and. Yeah. And, and, and like we did on today's ITL, sometimes I'll, I'll trigger a sample just so I can send the sample only to the to a reverb and get something different out of the reverb return that didn't have a hi-hat mic in it or whatever. So uh, I do. That. I love that too. Just to have a different tonality. Once, you're, once again, the reverb putting it in a, more, a different space. Yeah, yeah. Great answer though. Thanks. Uh, how fast does it go, Justin? Thank you for uh, surviving this. Well, uh, exercise in torture. <laughs> I got to tell you, I'm really humbled talking to you guys. It's amazing. Thank you so much. And we are we are honored to have you. We love the national community. We love the commitment to the artistic process there, and our audience, I'm sure, loves you. They certainly have yeah. a ton of requests. Couldn't I mean, thank you enough. Thanks. Man. I mean, I'm 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 going to go home and be a better mixer after this interview. I'm, I'm, I'm going to go home and be a better manager. The spring <laughs> that's, reverb, that's the modern thing. That's how powerful Justin is. I've been trying to get everything wide. I, 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 Justin, I appreciate your candid uh, remarks on a lot of this stuff because I'm going to rip you off. And, and, and we're also going to come back and see if you'll, if you'll join us again. Um, couldn't thank you enough, Justin. Thanks so much. Peace. Justin, I'll give you a call and hook you up with those, uh, those people we talked about. And thank you so much, my friend. And uh, when you see Ed C, give him a hug for me, okay? Wrap it up and say goodbye. All right. Thanks, Justin. Adios. Uh, okay, gang. Um, man, what a great show. Um, look, up, look up Justin Niebank, N-I-E-B-A-N-K, on, on Google and, and uh, check out some of his work. I think, I think it's like little mini classrooms in themselves, and we'll see you next week.